Hey everyone, welcome to the Doctors are Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of the things that we're putting on our feet. Today, this is me, Matt, going to do a solo episode on something that's near and dear to me, and we're going to talk about stability. We're going to talk about what it is, who it's for, and really the evolution of the term, because we've gotten a lot of questions recently about how much stability do I need, what is this? So I'd, I'd like to bring you along for the journey that I and the rest of the team at Doctors are Running are going through to understand what this thing is and who it might work best for, and also following up with how quickly it is changing. So what is stability, or as the term is actually starting to evolve, guidance? What does that mean? The current definition really centers, no pun intended, around how do you keep the foot on the platform and facilitate motion forward instead of excessively in the frontal plane if it's not necessary. In the past, what this really, really meant is it meant stability just referred to how much of a medial post or like how stiff can you make the inner side? Can you stop, quote unquote, stop the foot from pronating? And we'll define these terms just again. Can you stop the foot from pronating and keep it in a neutral position, meaning can you keep it in the middle? And often they weren't even talking about doing that in static or in motion. They were just talking about statically, how do you keep this foot in this supposedly perfect position? Now that's evolved because perfect we've learned doesn't exist. People exist in all types of motion, the, 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 in, in all types of positions and movements. And we realized the foot is so much more complicated than we gave it credit for, mostly because you can't do this without thinking about the rest of the body. So the foot operates at the end of a long mechanism called your lower extremity, which is an extension of your pelvis, your trunk, all this other stuff. You cannot look at these things in isolation. That is unfortunately too simplistic when you're talking about walking, running, you know, anybody that's gone to any kind of healthcare or, or medical or PT or whatever kind of school, if you've analyzed gait, you got to look at the whole thing. You can't just look at one area. Unfortunately, all the industry was only looking at the foot and ankle and a lot of healthcare um, thought that it all, as long as you corrected the foot, all kinds of stuff would get fixed. And you see this to this day, you see all kinds of advertisements for orthotics correcting back pain, which is very much a stretch. And I, I'm really going to encourage you before you go that route to actually get assessed by a professional, like not just some salesperson selling your orthotic, but like get assessed by a medical profession to go, are your foot and ankle, are your foot and ankle and your spine related? You know, there might be something there, there might not, but the whole, the whole chain, right. Operates together, which is why for those of us that worked in running stores, we were taught the pronation model, meaning if the foot pronates, you correct it. Okay. You're supposed to give somebody a stability shoe and you're supposed to give somebody just enough, a high enough amount of stability that it corrects that pronation and keeps their foot straight. And anybody that worked during that time realized very quickly that when you did that, there were still people who said, my ankle still hurts or actually my ankle, my knee or my hip now hurts more than I'm in the stability shoe. And I like that neutral shoe better. And that didn't mean that stability didn't work. It just meant that it wasn't working for that person. Okay, so again, going back to the definition of what stability has evolved into now is that how do we keep all the different variations of human movement and help facilitate people's motion forwards? And that whole idea of facilitation or guidance really came from some couple authors, but one of the most significant ones is going to be Dr. Ben Onig, who's considered kind of one of the godfathers of footwear research, who his idea was trying to move away from that pronation paradigm and going toward a um preferred movement pathway. He also came up with this great thing called the comfort belt filter, which suggests that shoes that are more comfortable typically tend to work better for people. Okay. So the preferred movement pathway or paradigm was that your body is going to move in a certain way. If you try to deviate and pull somebody away from that too far, they might not like that. Okay. They're moving that way for a reason for better or for worse. Footwear should help facilitate that motion forward. It shouldn't necessarily try to force you on one direction. There are some rare cases where that might be, that may be helpful in extreme examples. But for the most part, footwear should facilitate our unique movement patterns. Okay. Our movement patterns are as unique as our fingerprints. You know, when you, you get far enough into the field as I have in PT, I can tell people based on, I can ID people based on their gait. I'm getting to this point with my first year students in PT school at West Coast where I can, I know who they are based on how they're walking and moving. And we just have very unique movement patterns. But to assume that everybody needs to move the same way is very like minimalistic and like it, doesn't give credit to how unique our bodies are. Our joints, our bone sizes, all this stuff, our muscle sizes are so different, which means we're all going to move in slightly different ways. 
Now, creating footwear that facilitates that rather than forces that in one way is is really hard. And that's why the older model wasn't really working as the as, as we wanted it. And the reason it doesn't work super well for everyone is that pronation, and you've heard me talk about this before if you if you read any of our stuff, but if you haven't, pronation is not a pathology. It describes a type of movement. It's actually a triplanar movement. It's a combination of three different motions, meaning at least in the foot and ankle. There's also pronation, supination, the upper extremity. We're talking about foot and ankle. So when you say pronation, you're referring to ankle eversion, dorsiflex, foot, ankle and foot, eversion, dorsiflexion, and abduction. This is a combination of those three motions. They used to say, oh, this primarily happens at the subtalar joint, which the subtalar joint mostly has eversion. The rest of the foot can and will facilitate the rest of those motions, okay? This is how you shock absorb. When you land, most people will pronate, or at least they should. This is how you shock absorb. You have several muscles that help control this motion. One of the big one is the post, one of the big ones is the posterior tibialis controls this motion to help you shock absorb as you land. People that do not pronate have a higher risk for bone stress injuries, like stress fractures, things like that, because they have a harder time shock absorbing. People that tend to pronate more tend to actually have reduced risks of those type of injuries. They sometimes happen, but they have more issues with things like soft tissue injuries, plantar fasciitis, things like that. Although actually recent evidence said people with higher arches, stiff arches actually have greater risk of, of plantar fasciitis. Muscular stuff like posterior tibialis tendinopathies, Achilles tendinopathies, things like that. Though people with more collapsed arches or flatter feet tend to have more issues with, I shouldn't say flatter feet. Let me clarify that. People that tend to pronate more have that. And when we say flat feet versus pronated, those are two different things. If somebody truly has a flat foot, it means that they have a very low arch and they may not even pronate that much. Somebody that has pronated feet or feet that collapse means they have somewhat of an arch, but they just can't hold it up or, or it moves. Okay. That's pronation or pronated feet. Okay. Flat feet, just because you have flat feet doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you have a lower arch. It just means your foot isn't the way healthcare system typically defines it. That's not a bad thing, okay? That's just your mechanics. High arch feet tend to be stiffer. They tend to move really well front to back. Lower arch feet, flat feet tend to have a lot better ground stability and tend to move better going side to side and cutting and pivoting and things like that. So you just means you might be a little bit better at something else, okay? So I wanna take your fear away going, oh my gosh, I pronate. What does that mean? It's normal. Okay, it's normal to pronate. It's like pronation is exactly the same thing as like reaching up overhead, right? Shoulder flexion or like sh shoulder overhead reaching, okay? It's a movement and it's important. Now you can have too much of it or have poor control over it. So when you have those two and you have poor control, that's where you can have issues, okay? Because if you land and you collapse really quick and don't have very good strength, a quick eccentric motion because the posterior tibialis tendon is being lengthened and other structures are being lengthened, okay? Uh, while contracting, the quicker you go, a fast eccentric motion is the most stress you could put through muscles and tendons and different structures, okay? So you wanna have good control of these things. If you don't have good control, that's where you can get a lot, of, lot more stress, the goal of stability is, is to help facilitate that motion. And we actually know this, that oftentimes when you put people in a stability shoe, it doesn't necessarily change their motion, right? One of the most quote unquote stable shoes on the market today is the Brooks Beast. And there's plenty of people who you put them in the shoe and they still pronate in it, okay? The goal of a stability shoe or a guidance shoe is to help facilitate that motion, give them some more control over it, not necessarily change how much, but change the speed and help them get forwards, okay? So that's the purpose of a stability shoe, okay? Those people that supinate, same thing applies. Unfortunately, supination is not as normal, at least when you land, okay? People that all also like to think that they supinate just because there's wear on the outside of their shoe, that's not the case. People also think they supinate if they land in what's called an inverted position. That's not supination. Supination is where you land and roll out. It is very rare. Okay. It's more common as you tow off. All this stuff we're talking about is shock absorbent. Okay. When you tow off at the other end of gate, that's more normal for you to have supination there. Okay. So we're talking about back part of the foot. Most of it, we're talking about what happens when you land. That's majority, majority of where you pronate. Okay. So the goal of stability and guidance shoes now is to facilitate your motion forward while supporting 
how you move without trying to pull you too far away from what your norm is. Okay. That's very hard to do. Different people are going to respond different things. And that's why I'm going to talk about how the different ways you can find this if one method doesn't work for you. But before we go, go that far. And speaking of methods, you need to understand a little bit more about your anatomy. So what, where does pronation happen? Where does eversion happen? Okay. So the eversion of the foot and ankle primarily, and this is like your foot. If, if your feet, if your the sole of your foot is pointing outward, that's eversion. Okay. W inversion is the opposite. The sole of your foot's pointing in. Okay. When you, the majority of eversion typically comes from your subtalar joint, which is the joint, like major joint underneath the big joint that bends back and forth in the back of the ankle. It's like right at the connection of your heel bone. Okay. That's where the majority of eversion and inversion comes from. There is more of that inversion eversion than that can actually come from the midfoot and the forefoot as well, right? Because there's a lot of different joints in that area, but most of it typically happens in the subtalar joint. Okay. More of it comes forwards. When it comes to abduction, a lot of that motion does not happen at the subtalar joint. More of it happens kind of into the forefoot, into the midfoot, and a little bit more at the ankle, and a little bit, actually a tiny bit at the knee, to be honest with you, based on how that's connected. Final one, dorsiflexion. Where does the majority of that motion happen? The majority of that motion happens at the tail accrual joint or your major, major ankle joint. Okay. So it's really the whole foot that is really involved here. And the forefoot especially can definitely, I didn't give enough credit to the forefoot, can invert, evert. If you just take your toes and kind of pull them up and down on each side, there's a lot that can happen there, unless you've got a really stiff forward part of your foot. When people think about stability, they're usually talking about arches. Unfortunately, people only think about the medial longitudinal arch when there, in fact, are actually three arches. There's the medial arch that's usually typical to see. There's also a lateral longitudinal arch on the other side that's a little harder to see. And there's also a transverse arch in the front of your foot, right at your forefoot, right? So where all the metatarsal phalangeal joints, the end of all the metatarsals go, that where those, there's a kind of an arch right there where that's typically supposed to be up or down, okay? Again, another area that needs to shock absorb as you go through the forefoot and then it needs to come back. And I forgot to mention that you need to be able to pronate and supinate, okay? You need to pronate and then come out of it. That's how you shock absorb and bounce back, okay? Same thing with the forefoot, same thing with any of these arches. You can have flatness in any of these arches. You can have too much stiffness in any of these arches. One is not better than the other, and typically being somewhere in the middle is, is usually a little preferred, and sometimes some of us need some help getting back toward that middle, be it those of us who have stiff arches and they need we need a little mobility to work, or those of us who have a little laxity and we need a little more strength and movement control. Okay. So remember that when you talk about an arch, it's not just one part of the foot. Everybody likes to talk about the rear foot, the back of the foot, the, you know, the navicular, the subtalar joint, stuff like that. Your forefoot can also collapse and pronate. Okay. So you could have stuff in the back, in the rear foot, you can have midfoot and forefoot. All this stuff might need individual stability, depending on who you are and where your motion happens or where you need more control of that motion. Okay, so that's really kind of in a crazy nutshell what stability is and why, what kind of going in, what are the motions associated with you might be trying to work on. Now, I wanted to clarify again that pronation and these motions are not bad, but some people need more control and more help with that control as they deal with landing, absorbing the shock, and then turning it into propulsion some way and pushing off on the foot into um, terminal stance or the propulsive phase of running. Okay. Now, in the past, like I said, everybody thought that pronation was the source of all injuries. And then we started learning, actually, no, it's actually protective against some injuries and it's a risk factor for others. So who needs stability? So there's a couple different groups. Um, Malazo and some of his, Laurent Maslow and some of his great PhD students and, and his publishing found that those who typically respond best to stability shoes are really those who have had a history of pronation related injuries. If you pronate and you don't have a history of injuries and you don't like stability shoes, don't wear them. It probably means you don't work well with them. If you have a history of pronation related injuries, and that includes posterior tibialis tendinopathies, any kind of medial arch issues, any kind of like forefoot stuff like that you're collapsing there. Achilles tendinopathy or tendinitis is, can be another helpful thing for certain people, not everyone. If you have a history of those, a stability shoe might be helpful for you, 
And the last thing is if you find them comfortable, that's another reason that they might also work for you because with the comfort paradigm that from Ben Omenig as well also suggests, hey, you know what? Feels comfortable, feels good to run in, makes you feel better. That might be helpful. So taking this back to me, I have a history of posterior tibialis issues, both sides. I've got some Achilles issues, hence all my research is in Achilles tendinopathy. Um, although I like looking at older individuals because it tends to be more common, trying to understand that. I typically do a little bit better in stability shoes. Part of the problem is there weren't the great variety of stability shoes when I came into this industry. And I was like, I like running. A lot of these stability shoes are super clunky. And I realized over the years, I don't just want to be stuck with these shoes. I want to test stuff out. So how do I find other methods for stability? I'm very fortunate that the, the best thing I ever did was I've worked in t- incredibly hard on my strength and my stability. And that has helped from a musculoskeletal standpoint, allow me to run in pretty much everything like the stuff that you see behind me. If you're watching this on video, you know, we get a lot of shoes. I'm very lucky that I can handle running in just about everything. There's a couple of shoes that I can't do because they're just too unstable for the board majority of, of things I can handle just about anything. And that's taken time to adapt to. But when it comes to serious training, longer efforts, I typically need something a little bit more stable or I'm going to fatigue. Okay. And that's where things start. I start getting irritations and don't move as fast. So I still need some kind of guidance. I definitely prefer it. Now I found, like I said, stability shoes typically used to be clunky. They were not comfortable. There used to be some stability racing shoes, but they still weren't the best, right? They were still tended to be heavier, weren't as smooth. So I've tried to figure out, is there any other ways I could find shoes that would work for me? And so there's a couple different methods, and I want to give you this these this variety of tools here. Because in the past, like I said, it just used to be, does the shoe have a post or does it not? Okay. Things are a bit more complicated, and you can actually, there's several different ways you can create stability without necessarily needing a post. And for better or worse, we're not seeing as many posted shoes now. So you're definitely going to have to look for other things. This led me to the concept of what stable neutral is. And I don't want to take credit for that. I think Doctors Running is the first group to term that. But stable neutral basically means you got a shoe that's not a stability shoe, but it still ends up being very stable. There's a couple of methods you can do this. Okay. A lot of people work really well in those shoes. People that maybe don't respond well to medial posts. And a medial post, by the way, before I go farther, is usually a harder, a denser bit of foam on the medial side. Typically, there's a couple lateral shoes out there, uh, not very many, but there, it's a harder or more dense th- piece of the shoe on the medial side that's supposedly meant to provide resistance as you roll into it. Okay. That doesn't always work for people. Some people like myself, although sometimes I enjoy a posted shoe, some people find that when they roll into that, it's uncomfortable and it hurts, right? So, and we know that if a shoe hurts, it's not comfortable and it, you may not want to wear it. Okay. And you're probably not going to. So, and it may not, it may cause other issues as you try to compensate and get around that. Okay. So not everybody responds to posts. If you're someone that loves medial posts, great. There are still shoes out there, right? You like that pressure in your arch, whether or not it's actually quote unquote supporting you is a different story, but there are plenty of people who do better in these. They like that pressure. Okay. There's plenty of people with higher arches that like that. Don't ask me why. There's probably some reason for like proprioception, like body sense. you like that input into your foot. I'm not judging you. If you like it, feels good and it works for you. You're not getting hurt. Great. But posts were the classic thing. The other thing that used to exist, but we don't really have a lot of them is called wedges. And that's where if you actually either collapse or your foot was actually, you were born or your foot stuck in an inverted position. So when you landed, you automatically collapsed into E version. There was something called a wedge where it would actually bring the shoe up to your foot on that inner side and support you in a way that you were actually supported in that like kind of inverted position. Some people actually have that. Okay. The uh, New Balance Fresh Foam Bongo used to have that. It does not have it anymore. And I'll sh- I will give you an example of one shoe that does that mildly at the forefoot for those that need that. And that's a whole other com- conversation about varus and valgus angles, which we'll do a different time. But wedges used to actually hold your foot in this position. Like, again, one side of the foot was elevated and it held you there. Okay. Certain people do really well. Other people get pushed out and don't like that. Okay. That used to be the standard. We now have several other methods that we've seen throughout the industry and people have used them 
in several different ways, but not necessarily for stability. So the other things I want to talk about, biggest one that people talk about, and it's been common, is how stiff the shoe is, okay? The more stiff a shoe is, the less likely it is to bend and the less likely you are to get facilitated in one way except forwards. Stiffer shoe, go forwards at least to a certain level. When it's too stiff, then you're actually going to try to avoid it, okay? So an optimal level of stiffness. The other thing that's really common that we talk about is sidewalls, where the midsole is raised up on the lateral medial side, sometimes one or the other. So it kind of acts like if you've ever been to a bowling alley, like those, like the guide rails, like those kind of thing, which Brooks has termed. Okay. So it kind of keep, if you try to roll into it, it's just midsole material that keeps this just up on the side. So you keep rolling forward instead of that direction. Okay. There's other ways to do this, including internal geometry. And you're seeing shoe companies like Bro or Brooks a little bit, but Asics is doing this quite a bit. Saucony is getting on this. Hoka has done this a lot with the H-frame now. That the internal geometry is set up to facilitate it as you compress the foam for the foam to try to guide you to keep you forward. We're going to talk a lot about that one. The shape of the sole is also a way you can create stability. So a lot of shoes that are extremely curved, unlike the Keanu that has the midfoot cut out, typically were a tiny bit less stable, right? If you're somebody that pronates, if the midfoot is cut out, let's see if I can find it. I should have had this ready. Uh, what's a shoe that has the midfoot really cut out? Um, I should have done a better job of this. Uh, like for example, so the, I have the fast forward here. It's not an unstable shoe. It's just, there's nothing here on the medial side, right? So if there's nothing there and you collapse there, there's nothing to kind of push back against you, right? There's nothing to resist that. So you just collapse through it. Now, if you have, or someone that doesn't collapse there at all, then yeah, you don't care. Like there's nothing there. You don't need anything there to quote, unquote, I don't want to use the support, but there's no material there. Okay. Now, if you do, a shoe that has a wider base, a wider base shoe tends to be more stable. We're seeing a lot of these as you get more maximal shoes because the taller a shoe is, you need a wider base to actually make it stable. So a wide base is another thing that you can use, okay? Especially if you fill in the midfoot. If you tend to cut the midfoot out in any direction, you will typically tend to go through there because of the passive path of least resistance. The... B the geometry, I already talked about geometry, sole flare is another way to do this. And that's how much the midsole extends beyond the shoe on the medial or lateral side. The more it extends in one direction, the more resistance you're going to get there. The more, and in certain cases, it can either provide resistance or pitch you in the other direction. So we talked about medial posts, shoe stiffness, sidewalls, we just talked about sole flares. We talked about wider bases. We talked about internal geometry. And the last part of that internal geometry is the midsole composition, okay, is that you could actually use foams of different densities to facilitate motion. And some may say, oh, that you know, it's a post. But, you know, Saucony, a couple other companies have been having like a really soft, essential part of the shoe. And then the outside has a more firmer material on the entire length of the shoe. So that's how you can use some of the new super foams. This stuff is really cool. Final thing that I got to talk about is the upper. So the upper can make or break this. You can have a really stiff sole, but if your foot's rolling off the top, that's bad. So lock down, right? So I really like gusseted to tongues because it helps lock the foot onto the platform. Some people like, excuse me, stiff heel counters. Stiff heel counters can actually kind of keep your heel in there a little bit better, although we found that the heel actually moves regardless of the counter. But some people like a stiff counter because it can act as a way to stabilize the rear foot. And there's also different ways that you can use overlays and things to lock down the foot, okay? So those are the different methods you can use. And I want to talk you through each one of them and how different companies are doing this. So medial posts are not as common anymore. There's still a couple companies that use them. So the New Balance 860 is a shoe that still uses a medial post. The Hook Arahi in its most version, the 7, still has what's called a J-frame, but is technically still a post where it's got a firmer material here and it wraps a little bit around the heel. So a sh on the lateral side. So a shoe like this, you're going to feel pressure up into your foot. Okay, it's built into the sole. Yes, this shoe has sidewalls, but it's built into the sole to have a firmer material that you kind of roll into or and, or roll away from because you're going the path of least resistance. People that tend to respond best to posts are people that typically like pressure into the medial side of their foot or arch or laterally, depending on where it is. People that don't tend to respond very well to these are people that don't like that pressure. Sometimes I like it. 
Sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's too much. You can get shoes that are as intense as the Brooks Beast, right? That still has a medial post and there's a ton of pressure combined with all the other things that we'll talk about in this shoe to something as tiny as these small little pieces on the inner side that we don't really have anymore. But you see that small little gray indentation of the medial aspect called a mild stability shoe. Okay, so that's some of the shoes with the medial post. Hoka Rocky is a big one. 860, there's a few other out there, but those are examples of what a medial post is. Shoe stiffness is another thing that, again, that I mentioned creates stability. And I thought the Brooks Beast is a great example of this because this shoe is so freaking stiff. Um, Brooks does heel stiff this really well. If a shoe doesn't twist, right? They used to call this a twist test. not the most accurate thing, but it can be helpful if you need just a rigid shoe under your foot. So Shoe that's more stiff, right? So plates can actually create this, although you have to be careful because some of the plated shoes also have super soft foams with narrow platforms that you'll roll right off. But stiffer shoes typically tend to be a little more stable. And as I mentioned, you can get that through plates. You can get that through having a ton of midsole material. So a lot of uh, higher level uh, maximal shoes tend to be a little bit stiffer, which is why they tend to be a little more stable if things are done correctly, not necessarily super shoes. But sole stiff is something that can be found. So Plated shoes, great option for this. If you can get a plate plus a couple of these other things, it might actually work really well for you. And the great part is the plates typically add stiffness throughout the length of the shoe. So it's only instead of only finding it in one area, like medial posts tend to be in one area, plate can go the whole way or shoe stiffness can go the whole way. So if that's something that people that work best with stiff soles are ones that typically have more mobility overall, so especially like some joint laxity or loose ligaments. Pe people that have that kind of laxity tend to do better in a stiffer shoe. Those of us that have stiffness already in our foot tend to not do as well in a stiffer shoe, Okay, at least for training. So when you get into racing, it's a, a different story. But that's people who might work well with stiffness and those who might not. As I mentioned, another one we talked about, sidewalls. So a lot of companies are using sidewalls. You're seeing the structure that has... I, I'm not really sure. It's a really stiff shoe. It's got this really prominent medial sidewall here, but sidewalls are the extension up of the midsole along the side. Lots of maximal shoes have these. And the goal was because they wanted your foot to sit in the shoe so it didn't roll off these really tall platforms, which ironically created very stable shoes. A lot of stability shoes have sidewalls now. It's a very easy way to kind of create and guide you forwards. Brooks has a lot of them, right? So that they call them guide rails. Hoka does these really, really well. A lot of, you know, Sauconies, a lot of their shoes have done these really, really well. Lots of companies are doing these really, really well. Um, but again, they come up along the side of your foot. And as you roll into it, it's kind of like those bowling lanes that guide your foot forwards. Now, people that don't like posts or don't like something pushing up into a specific part of their foot, sidewalls tend to do really well. There's a lot of neutral shoes like maximal shoes that have sidewalls. So if you see that, you can go, hey, this actually might be a stable shoe. The caveat you have to realize is if the midsole material is too soft, it's not going to, you're just going to, it's just going to collapse. I've had several shoes recently that are super soft foams. They're like, oh, it's the sidewall, but it doesn't do anything because it's so soft. You just collapse into it. So people that don't do well with posts, but just want kind of longer guidance and just have helping them roll forward without too much pressure to their foot tend to do better with sidewalls. It's a great method. The people that don't do well with sidewalls are people that are sensitive to blisters. Because again, at the end of the day, the shoe coming up around your foot means there's more pressure on the medial and lateral sides of your foot. So if you're someone, if your foot's sliding or if you're sensitive to friction, this can actually cause some blisters. And certain people are more sensitive to that than others. So if you have risks with blisters on the uh, and with sidewalls, sidewalls are not may not be a great option for you. Now, sole flare. So that's how much does the foam extend side to side? Okay. People that do very well with this are people that like just a really wide platform. Okay. That can work really, really well for them. People that don't do as well for these are people that land in heavily inverted position. So I don't usually have a big problem with medial sole flare. Lateral sole flare is where people can have some issues because the problem with lat too much lateral sole flare is because the, the, the midsole is extending this way when you land and it's very normal for your foot to land in that inverted foot position with your foot, your sole of your foot pointing in because your body sets yourself up for pronation. It's normal. Pronation is normal, at least some of it, okay? 
when the soul extends out this way, when you land like that, you're going to hit the ground early before your body's ready. Your body sets its muscles up to turn on at a very specific point right before you land and getting ready to shock absorb. The, if you land early, you're going to make impact before your muscles are, are, are ready. And that can cr create a lot of drying, can be uncomfortable. And because of basic physics and having external moment arm, it can really like accelerate the amount of motion that you have down. So you, it might increase the rate of pronation as you hit the ground, right? Increase speed, increase stress with eccentric forces. So increase tensile stress through the, like higher stress through medial structures. Okay. So it, it can be really good, but people that tend to really land in an inverted position, that soul flare may not work very, very well. For me, s lateral soul flare is not something I respond well to at the heel and other areas. That's a different story. Um, the, how am I trying to say this? That can be offset by having an appropriately developed heel bevel that's like centered slightly posterior lateral, but unfortunately not a lot of people do that. So a wider sole can be really good if you don't do well with sidewalls, if you don't do well with the medial post, it can be another way to create stability and also another way you'll, thing you'll see in maximal shoes, trail shoes, and certain types of stability in shoes now. Geometry, we got, we'll get into just a second. I want to get through the sole width. So sole width kind of has to do a little bit with sole flare, but having sections of the, of the sole missing can either add or take away stability. Typically when something, a chunk is missing and you can fall into it, it typically tends to take it away. An example of how this doesn't always apply is something like the Adidas Adios uh, Pro 3, where they have the inside of the midfoot missing, but because the uh, rods and there's a sidewall here because the rods are so stiff, it actually compensates for that decently well, um, but not always the best option as seen by the Takumi Sin, which I could collapse into. So if you fill something in, it inherently makes it more stable. So a lot of companies used to cut out the midfoot because like, oh, people aren't putting pressure there. So why should we care? Well, it's just, it'll save weight. Fortunately, people that like me who do roll through it, having something there makes creates more stability because something is pushing back there. Okay. So filling in the midfoot is a great way to make the shoe inherently more stable. Okay. Having the sole be a little bit wider. Okay. A wider foundation is inherently more stable. What we've been seeing late re recently is another way to do this is actually take part of the midsole out if you're trying to facilitate motion. So a lot of companies, instead of having the midfoot, uh, the, the medial midfoot cut out, they're actually cutting out the lateral aspect and the, the Celio, um, X, uh, X, one, why am I forgetting this right now? Don't judge me on this. It's been a long, long, long day. So if you cut out the lateral aspect of this shoe, you are going to facilitate motion in that direction. Typically, what we suggest is having both sides filled in. But for those people that need some medial stability, if you see that cut out, that might work really, really well. The opposite is true. If you're somebody that tends to go too far lateral, having a midfoot cut out might be helpful for you. So seeing either how narrow or how wide the, the midfoot or any part of the shoe is can help tailor motion in a different direction. So that's how the base can be helpful. The straighter and more filled in the thing is, the more stable it tends to be. Now let's talk about internal geometry. So the A6 Keanu, the Hoka Gaviota 5, the Saucony Guide, the most recent version are great examples of how they're using internal aspects of this thing to help facilitate motion. So what that means is, how the sole inside is set up is such that certain parts of it are going to collapse quite a bit and certain parts are going to not. And so your body's always going to go through the paths of least resistance. So you're going to go through wherever the softer part of the foam is and try to avoid wherever the more firmer aspect is. So the Keanu does this in a really interesting way where there's actual pillars from what I understand inside the shoe. But they actually have this very interesting thing that they were trying where it's called 4D guidance where this medial thing, which we used to think was going to be a post, right? Firmer. It's actually softer and more bouncy, which means what their idea was when you land and collapse into this thing, it's supposed to actually bounce you back out, which is what your foot's supposed to do, right? You pronate and it gets you out of pronation. Okay. So that's an example of how they're doing things differently than a post. The other really great example of this is the Saucony Tempest, where they use a lot of internal geometry to create a stable ride without that typical post feeling. Okay, so where they have an, a central layer, a central layer of their power run PB, and on the lateral aspects is their power run EVA. You are going to naturally, when you run, are naturally going to go through the center aspect of the softer foam. You're not going to be able, you, your body's going to go through the path of least resistance, so you're less likely to push into the power run. 
What's cool about this method is oftentimes this will work for people with neutral mechanics. If you're not going side to side, it's not going to bother you because there's nothing to push up into your arch like a post, which is why the Tempest actually worked for our entire team, even Andrea and Nathan, who are very, very sensitive to these methods. So that those are that's a, a great option there. And it kind of goes into the midsole composition. The last thing, heel counters, stiffness in the upper. So heel counters, as I mentioned, are these stiff pieces of plastic that are kept. This is probably not the best shoe. Um, and I'm going to go back really quick because I missed poor Mizuno talking about geometry. So I'll go back to that in a second. But the counters are the stiff pieces of plastic in the rear foot that's supposed to give the back of the shoe structure. People that tend to ha like a very secure heel, maybe their heel moves or they just like a stiff heel back there, is where heel counters work really, really well. Again, as I mentioned, some recent research found that people actually, even with a counter, their heels actually still move within the shoe, which is why... A lot of current day research, when they're doing shoe research, they have to cut holes and put the little dots. If you've ever done biomechanics stuff before, you got to put these little reflective dots. They have to put reflective dots and a little like extender from the actual heel bone out of the shoe to see what the heel is actually doing because it does something different to the shoe. But people that want stiffer rear foots tend to do better with heel counters. People that don't tend to do well with heel counters are people like me who maybe don't do as well with a stiff thing. Or you have something like a Haglin deformity, meaning you, your Achilles insertion is a little bit inflamed and kind of swollen. And so a hard piece of plastic pushing up to that doesn't feel very good. So that's like me. Heel counters don't work very well with me, but I still deal with them and always try to warn you about which one might work. It has a heel counter, a stiff heel counter, which one does not. As I tend to prefer ones without. So there's also other things in the in the upper that kind of provide minor roles in terms of overlays and things like that. The midfoot lockdown is always really important, but the that's that's something you'll feel as you put the shoe on. Ge going back to geometry, I got to give a shout out to Mizuno who've been doing this before. This was cool that they actually haven't really used medial posts, or at least not very frequently. What they typically do is the internal geometry of their shoe provide stability. So they they were using plates long before most people were, although they were using PBAX plates, not PBAX foams. They were using PBAX plates to actually, with the geometry of the plate, to actually create what's called this wave plate or fan. They would fan it out on the medial and lateral side, actually, so that when you rolled into the plate, you would go forward because the fans would keep you in the center. So this is a great option if you don't typically tend to do well with posts, you want something unique, you like something, a stiffer rear foot, because Mizuno typically tends to be really stiff in the heel. That's another option for you. I apologize, I forgot to mention them. But yeah, so these are all the different methods you can find. The final question is, how much do you need? And the answer is, it's going to change, okay? At some point in your life, you might not need any. Later, you might need a little bit more. It'll depend on your training, your injuries, all that kind of stuff. It will vary. So how do you find what's going to work best for you? And honestly, the cop-out answer is you got to find what's most comfortable for you. Most people are going to do really well in a stable neutral shoe or a mild stability or guidance shoe, okay? A little goes a long way. I really think we over-prescribed stability shoes and cause more problems than we really needed. And that includes orthotics, by the way. We definitely over-prescribed those. And I'm going to stand by my statement. Unless you really like the feel of an orthotic, if you just want stability, get a stability shoe. If a company is trying to sell you a stability shoe and orthotic, they're trying to upsell you. That's not necessary. Unless if you only reason to get an orthotic is if you really like the orthotic and the way orthotics feel. And typically you should try to get an orthotic with a neutral shoe if you just like the orthotic. Okay. Yes, there is some variation to that. We caution people with this because orthotics and shoes, we don't always know how they're going to interact because companies don't test shoes with orthotics, except for a very few, um, the Ghost Max and the Saucony uh, Echelon are the two really ones where they are tested to accommodate orthotics. So just be careful with that. Okay. So how much you really need is going to vary. Okay. Most people need the mild amount. There are some people that if mild isn't enough, moderate might be fine. Right. And you're not going to know this until you really put your foot in the shoe because all of our biomechanical models aren't following up. You can see people that prone it a lot that don't do well with any stability because that's how they shock absorb and they're really good at it. There are people that don't pronate very, they only pronate a little bit and they need a lot of stability. Okay. Cause you're not always able to see it while they're running with a shoe on. There's a lot of other things going on that might direct this. So if you find as you put the shoe on, you're like, dad, this doesn't feel stable enough. 
you might need to go up. Okay. So there's a lot of mild stability shoes out there right now, just because there's a lot of shoes that are stable, neutral, that kind of blur that line. The shoes that tend to be more modest stability are things like the Brooks Adrenaline. I would have said sock any guy in the past, but now it's a little bit more mild given we're stable, neutral thing, although it still does work. Hoka Gaviota is kind of like that moderate to higher level. I didn't mention the Hoka Gaviota's H frame, which is interesting where they've kind of got like the stiff midfoot and then extends back and forth. So you kind of can roll into or not. I'm going off tangent. BJ is going to get mad at me. Um, the A6 Keanu is still considered a moderate stability show. Those very well integrated um, Hoka Gaviota, as I mentioned, the Hoka Arahi, which is still posted the um, who else am I thinking about the Nike structure, which comes out, even though it's technically mild stability, it's stiff enough and the sidewall is strong enough that it might be, good enough for someone that needs moderate stability. This basically means that mild is enough for you. And you're going to know this as you take a shoe out and you learn it and you go, oh, this, I still get fatigued after a certain number of miles. Or, hey, this just doesn't feel stable enough for me. I get, it, my foot doesn't feel good in it. It feels like I'm going to roll off the platform. I'm collapsing more than I, I, I feel like I like. That's where maybe moderate stability is going to be helpful. Okay. The final level is your motion control, your higher level stability shoes. So your shoes like your Brooks uh, Beast, which is one of the few out there. If you need the, if you just want the most stiff shoe, if you want sidewalls, if you want a post, if you want a stiff heel counter, if you want a white base, literally this shoe has all the different methods put in this and geometry. If you're like, dude, I have a super mobile foot. It collapses. I don't have very good control of it. And I want the maximum control. And I just like as much stiffness as possible. That's where the Brooks Beast is going to come in. Okay. And I will say this shoe is also one that was overprescribed, but there's still a lot of people that do very, very well with this shoe, even to this day, which is why I wrote that article some time ago about why we still need shoes like this, because there are people that do really, really well with this that need all these different things. So if you find that one method isn't working enough for you and you think you might need all of them, a motion control shoe like the Brooks Beast or the Brooks Addiction, which is still out there, um, might be good for you. But that's one of the few motion control shoes left on the market. Okay, The Glycerin GTS is almost there. Um, it's not quite as stiff as it used to be, but it's still got quite a bit of midfoot and rearfoot stability. So that's also another option if you want something a little bit more cushion. But the answer not to cop out on you is you cannot just rely on on biomechanics and looking at how much you pronate or don't, because we know all these different methods do not necessarily change how much you pronate. It doesn't change the actual angles, but it does change the velocity. It can give you more control over this stuff. So that's when I say how much stability you need, that's what you need to be thinking about. And that comes down to, Hey, put the shoe on. It's it's, I'm sorry. There's no exact measure of how much is just enough. That's just not. And I say this as a biomechanist doing a PhD in this, there's no such thing as like, Oh, there's this perfect amount. You got to have, you got to learn. You got to go and try some shoes on. Okay. You have to figure out, Hey, how much feels enough? How much feels too little? And that's going to take some experimentation. You might be wrong one time. That's okay. And being a little wrong is okay. Cause even people that need moderate stability are going to do fine and mild stability. So lots of people that really do well in a shoe like the Asics Keanu or the Brooks Beast or like maybe Brooks Beast like strip or the, the Glycerin GTS or the Adrenaline. You have a couple mild stability options like the Hyperion GTS where if you want to do a faster day, you maybe want a little bit less stability but something there that's faster, this exists and you're not going to die wearing a mild stability shoe. In fact, what the evidence suggests is that having a couple variations might be a good thing. So don't panic and go, did I get enough stability? Go, you know what? Maybe I need a mild stability shoe one day and a moderate or higher stability shoe another. And having a little variation might be good for your body. So when you ask how much stability you need, don't panic and, and just realize if you need some, having a little variety might be key and figure out where you typically work best. And that's going to take some experimentation. It's not a bad thing. Just know that biomechanics hasn't been very predictive of this. And I'm sorry, it's going to piss some people off, but that's the truth. Okay. That comfort and how you feel and how the shoe feels to you underfoot is going to be one of the more predictive factors. Once you've learned how to appropriately predict it for yourself, which is the whole point of what we do is helping you learn what's going to work best for you as an individual. Cause it's, it's so variable. My own journey was that, Again, I was like, posts, the posted shoes of the past, a lot of them weren't working for me. And I kept being told, hey, you pronate like crazy. I had a biomechanics professor say, you pronate so much, I don't know how you run forward. And then I won the Northwest Conference Championship for uh, the 10K. I was like, okay, well, suppose I pronate. This is that bad. 
So I looked for alternative methods. I trained in minimal shoes for strengthening. I looked for other ways to get through this. And sight was did very well with sidewall. Started talking about this, and I'm hoping this conversation helps you learn because again, we're all different, and that's okay. And that means you need to be okay experimenting and learning because that's the best thing about this sport is you'll never learn too much. Okay. There's always something new to learn, especially about your own body. So as always, I hope this was helpful because it's us just trying to figure out the science of the stuff that we're putting on our feet. And the science is much more complicated than, than you might want. But if you can distill that down and realize, Hey, if you can figure out what works for you, there's a lot of different types of stability. You can figure out which one works best for you. What combination that probably exists out there somewhere. And that's what we write up all these shoe reviews and address that section. Hopefully that helps. We have an entire stability shoe section and where we talk about this as well. So please go check out the website. We're always open to different ideas. This was inspired, by the way, by many of the different questions that we get. We don't always get to all the different questions that are emailed to us or messages us on Facebook or whatever, but we do hear you and we do want to try to answer you. So we appreciate your patience and hope this helps. And as always, I appreciate you listening, reading, following on, whatever. Come back soon. We'll have more soon.